So I'm going to talk, uh, introduce Sam Shuket. As I said, he was the executive. He is the executive officer of the California Coastal Conservancy, where he's been since July of 2001. Um, he was uh, for six years executive director of the California League of Conservation Voters, an organization which most of us are familiar with. It has 25,000 members. He was the vice president of the Fish and Game Commission from 1999 to 2003, um, and. We are very happy to have Sam, and I think it's going to be a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to be here. It's nice not to have to schlep up to Sacramento for a 9 a.m. conference. Um, and for those of you that came down, thank you for coming. Uh, before I get started, uh, I wanted to, now you know how I feel when I have to go to meetings up there at 9 o'clock. Um, I want to thank uh, some of the folks who contributed slides to my presentations, uh, Phil Williams and Associates, Michelle Orr, Jeremy Lowe, Phyllis Faber, and, and Steve Crooks, and of course my staff, Dick Wayman, who helped put it together, and Amy Hutzel, who critiqued it, and Peter Brand, uh, who uh, contributed some slides. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with us, there we go, whoops. Uh, we're the State Coastal Conservancy. We're the non-regulatory coastal management agency for California. Our jurisdiction is the coastal zone of the state, the uh, three-mile state waters, uh, all nine Bay Area counties, thanks to Senator Scher, and um, the uh, watersheds that drain to the coast. Our mission is to preserve, protect, and restore the resources of the California coast. We were created in 1976, uh, and we pride ourselves on our use of entrepreneurial techniques. We don't actually like children, but we put, <laughs> we put this kid here to show you the risk from, from sea level rise. He's going to be in big trouble if he, you know, if, he, uh, if he stays there. And pardon me while I fumble around. There's not much room up here. Um, We've uh, preserved over 200,000 acres in the state. Uh, we've constructed uh, uh, over 600 miles of coastal trail and public access ways, some of which will no doubt soon be underwater. Uh, and we currently have about 800 projects underway. Uh, so obviously the question of climate change and sea level rise is near and dear to our heart. And one of the things that we do a great deal of throughout the state in the Bay Area and elsewhere is uh, the restoration of coastal wetlands. Uh, it's commonly said that we've lost about 90% of our, of our coastal wetlands. We are engaged in restoring about 40,000 acres of coastal tidal wetland here in, here in the Bay Area. There's another 5,000 acres under restoration now in, uh, in, in Southern California. Uh, my agency in some cases actually owns the land. In other cases, we helped acquire it, and in most cases we're uh, helping to plan the restoration, and in some cases we're actually helping to build it. And I'm going to talk uh, mostly about what we're doing here uh, in the Bay Area, but I wanted to just give you a sense of the geographic scope. That's uh, Arcata Marsh uh, in Humboldt Bay, actually one of our very first wetland restoration projects. That's Ormond Beach in Ventura County, which I'm going to talk about. Um, this is Biona Wetlands in the middle of uh, L.A., and it's a, a brilliant photographer who actually made this look like a natural environment, because um, <laughs> it usually doesn't look like that to me when I'm there. Uh, and these are the uh, Tijuana Estuary uh, wetlands on the, the border between the United States and Mexico and San Diego. So tidal wetlands, as it turned out, uh, are actually a three-in-one uh, solution for sea level rise. Does anybody remember three-in-one oil? I, I love that stuff, and it's, it's a much better use for oil than, uh, than burning it in your car. And I don't know if they still make it, but tidal wetlands help buffer the levees that we need to build to protect against flooding and sea level rise. They properly design, or in their natural state, they can adapt to sea level rise, and as Will mentioned, they sequester carbon, and as it turns out, they do a better job of that than almost anything. So here's the graph that you've seen a couple of times. Uh, 
and I don't want to dwell too much uh, on it. This is the historic uh, sea level rise that's taken place here in the Bay. The uh, International uh, Panel on Climate Change uh, has thrown out a couple of different scenarios for, uh, for sea level rise. Uh, there's considerable debate uh, as to how conservative or how, or how uh, 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 not conservative this, 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 this projection is. The state actually uh, uh, took a look at this uh, when we did the, um, the uh, Delta Resource Management uh, Review and uh, felt that, in fact, it might be too low. It, it's not taking into account uh, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, and in fact, some scientists argued that if you actually just drew a straight line, it would go up. It would go up even faster. Our planning assumption at the Coastal Conservancy is for three feet in the next hundred years. That's at the high end of things, but we think that that kind of keeps us safe because if you plan for the worst, you know you'll be surprised by the best. If you don't plan for the worst, you can't. It'll be too late when you know, when the seas, uh, when the seas rise. Uh, it is entertaining sometimes to think about, you know, the worst, worst case. So this is the, these are the Biona wetlands uh, aerial view in, in Southern California. And if the, the Greenland ice sheet melted in its entirety um, and we got five meters of sea level rise, it would all be underwater pretty much, except for a few little, a few little dots. And you can't see it from the aerial, but this is, uh, this is actually bluff here. So these, these guys would be okay. Um, and of course, we have a very different problem in Southern California than we do in Northern California because in Southern California, the coastal plain is filled with expensive stuff right up to the edge of the water. Although we do have a few places that we can uh, that we can restore. Um, one place in Southern California that we are able to work almost from scratch and prepare for sea level rise and build some coastal wetlands is Ormond Beach. And this is in Ventura County. It's the town of Oxnard. Uh, the, the, the town is actually all around here. Uh, it's evolved from being an agricultural community to a, essentially a suburb now of, uh, of, uh, of Los Angeles. Uh, we've so far with the Nature Conservancy acquired this land here. And we actually own this beautiful uh, former tank farm area here. And these are, uh, there's a duck club and, a, and, a, and an Air Force, uh, a Navy air station over here. And when we, uh, the, the next piece of land we'd like to acquire, and we've been in negotiations with the landowner, are these sod farms here. And the reason that we'd like to do that is because when we did a, a LIDAR map <clears throat> to get the elevations, we we realized that uh, as sea level rises, it's going to want to come up over here. So, and in fact, historically, this was a series of of lagoons and uh, and, and river delta, and this was all this was all wetland area up here. So, if we can acquire these parcels of land, and I think eventually we will be able to, then we can restore them to tidal wetlands, and we can design them in such a way that they can adapt to to sea level rise and, and provide some protection for the development that probably inevitably is going to, you know, move, move down towards here. There aren't too many places in Southern California where we can do this, but, but this is one of them. Um, natural tidal wetlands or properly designed wetlands can adapt to sea level rise, and this is called the transgression process, which I think is kind of a sexy term. But I want to explain it because it's pretty important to, uh, to, the, to the rest of my talk. Essentially, oops, what happens um, in, the, in the mud flats is that the sediments get stirred up, and when they get stirred up, they get deposited back on the marsh plain, and that allows the marsh plain to grow so that you know, here's, here's current mean low lower water and mean high higher water, and here's the future low water and the future high water. But essentially, it, it enables, if things are either well designed or in their natural state, it enables the marsh, if it has room, to move up as, as the sea moves up, essentially. So 
that's why it's good to have uh, tidal wetlands buffering, buffering your landscape. Now, in order for this to happen, <clears throat> you need mud here. And we have a crying need for dirt at the Coastal Conservancy. We can't get enough. We need five or six uh, million cubic yards of dirt uh, in, the, in the Bay Area right now just for Hamilton alone. We're probably going to need some for the South Bay. Uh, sometimes uh, you can take the crude approach to feeding the mudflats. This is called the, the rainbow method, I guess, because this is supposed to be a, a mud uh, rainbow. I think more commonly it's, it's, it's slurried in in, uh, in in pipelines. And if you're familiar with the Coastal Sediment Management Work Group and their report, um, which is a fine uh, insomnia cure, but in fact an important document, one of the key points they make is that we have to start thinking of sediment as a resource as opposed to just kind of waste material that, that, we, put into, that we put into landfills. Uh, because where we have sediment and where we don't and our ability to move it around is going to be really critical to our ability to adapt to, to, uh, to sea level rise. Um, another way to feed a mud flat uh, that's a little bit less crude, uh, is to put uh, mounds of sediment in, knowing that as the tides come in and out, it will move the mud up to where you want it to go. Um, we have to worry about what's in the sediment, because sometimes the sediment is com contaminated, and the regulatory agencies don't like that, and you know, it, can, it can get us into trouble. Um, and we also have to think about what the biological impacts are going to be of moving sediment around and putting it, taking it from one place, putting it into another place. So assuming that you have a tidal wetland and it's functioning properly and it's moving up as sea level uh, moves up, the second benefit that you get is flood protection. Uh, and the way this works is... Uh, you know, here we have a levee and there's no wetland and the waves uh, are slamming directly into the levee uh, with a great deal of force and you get enough wave runup eventually to cause some flooding and this kind of situation would look kind of like this, ugly, nasty. Uh, contrast that with a beautiful tidal wetland and the waves, when they run up, they hit the mud flat and they hit the plants and they lose energy. And because they lose energy, they don't hit the levee as hard. And because they don't hit the levee as hard, they're less likely to, to flood and the levee will last longer. And in fact, um, the levee doesn't have to be as big. Uh, and this is a graph that shows the relationship between how much outboard marsh you have and how high a levee you have to build. So if you have 60 meters of outboard marsh, you might only need a, you know, a 10 and a half meter levee. If you only have 10 meters of outboard marsh, you need a bigger levee. And of course, a bigger levee means more money. Um, I put the math up there just so that you all know that you know, I know math. <laughs> sort of. Um, some work that's been done in Britain has actually established that if you have tidal wetlands, which for some reason they call saltings, um, you can build smaller levees and thus cheaper levees. So, you know, here's the no wetland, 12 foot high crest wall scenario, 60 meters of wetland, four meter high uh, crest, 400 pounds per meter of seawall, 5,000 pounds per meter of seawall down here, an order of magnitude cheaper. Um, as Will pointed out, the process of adapting to uh, climate change is going to be expensive, so anything we can do to make things cheaper uh, is better. Now, the other scenario that we're looking at in the Bay Area, and this is typical of Hamilton, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of that in a few minutes, is um, a scenario in which the levee is, is outboard and the restoration area uh, is, is, is inboard, in which, oops, in which case the, uh, the levee over time is going to, uh, is going to erode. Uh, 
And as Will mentioned, a lot of the lands around the bay have subsided, and in many cases quite extremely. So in the North Bay, there's areas we're working in that are nine feet below sea level. Parts of uh, the South Bay, Alviso, 15 feet below sea level. Uh, because the soils, when they dried out, they, they, comp when they compacted, and they dried out because the levees were built that walled them off from the bay. So in situations like this, what we'd like to do is do some restoration uh, in here so that we can start the accretion process going so that uh, when the levee fails or when we breach it because we're creating a wetland um, we have some we have some safety uh, some safety space. The last thing that wetlands do, tidal wetlands do, not freshwater, but tidal wetlands do, is they sequester carbon, and they sequester carbon at a much higher rate than any of Ruskin Hartley's dinky little redwoods up on the north coast. <laughs> um, it, you're welcome. That's why that's why we have uh, you know we oops that's why we have the uh, the dinky little redwoods here you know, versus the, the mighty uh, marsh uh, grasses there. Uh, but in fact, a tidal marsh can produce 8,000 metric tons per year uh, of, of plant matter. In central and, and, uh, and uh, southern California, the marshes uh, can produce between 790 and, and 1,080. Uh, they can sequester between 790 and 1,080 grams of carbon per meter per square meter uh, uh, per year. And because of the accretion process that I talked about, the carbon that is being sequestered can get buried. And as long as it's buried and it's not exposed to oxygen, it will not get released into the atmosphere. So the tidal wetlands can sequester carbon more efficiently than any other uh, ecosystem. They can protect uh, our land and they can uh, enable us, to, they can adapt themselves to sea level rise and they can uh, make it cheaper to build, uh, to build the levees we have to build. Here's a few of our, of our projects. This is a project that was done while I was still in high school. Uh, it's the, the Muzi March in, in Novato. People tell me that we really uh, uh, didn't do a very good job there, but we learned a lot from our mistakes. Uh, and that meant that when we did the Sonoma Baylands project in 1999, we did a better job, uh, although I understand that people had to go out in the dark of night uh, without permits and fix the levee breach here a little bit. But having done that, we now have a nice uh, functioning wetland with levees behind it. So, you know, here's the mudflat zone, and it means that as sea level rises, uh, uh, dirt essentially should accrete in here and the marsh should should, uh, should rise as well. Um, I've mentioned several times Hamilton. This is in the North Bay. This is Novato in Marin. This is actually an old picture. Hamilton used to be a, an Army airfield. This has all been uh, developed now. It's, it's a residence in the city of Novato. So what we've done here is we've built a large levee because the project area actually goes off over here. Uh, and now we're bringing dredge material from the Port of Oakland to raise the level of this land because it's subsided uh, you know, up to nine feet right here. And when we've raised it up enough, we'll be able to breach this levee, let the bay come back in, let the marsh reestablish itself. Uh, so as a part of this project, we've protected these people and they'll have a nice uh, wetland area in their backyard that will adapt to, uh, to sea level rise and sequester some of the carbon that they uh, excrete as they drive their cars through the mall. The, uh, the biggest project uh, that we're involved in, in in the state, and in fact the largest restoration project west of the Mississippi, are the South Bay salt ponds, and the state and the federal government purchased these ponds, these ponds, and these ponds. These are still being used for salt. This is Alviso, where, which is 15 feet below sea level, but in fact all of this land, and there's a couple of million people living around here, has, has subsided. So again, what we're going to be able to do here is essentially uh, reconstruct a levee system on the outside of this project and then restore these wetlands uh, so that they can both protect the levees, accrete, uh, and, and, uh, and sequester carbon. 
And this uh, project is being done in an adaptive management, which is kind of a fancy way for saying we're going to, you know, we're going to we're going to do it as it uh, as it evolves. Uh, we're going to start with half managed ponds and half tidal wetlands and see how it goes. Um, you know, could be that. Uh, we don't make it to 90% tidal, 10% management. We might have to stop somewhere. We might, even, uh, we might even have to move back. But the planning anticipates considerable flexibility uh, in the future for this project. Uh, we have a pretty extensive science agenda and that we need to pursue. And we also have a lot of monitoring that we have to do because we need to see if the marsh and the mudflats are performing the way we uh, the way we expect them to. We need to understand the sediment budget, and that's always a very local thing. There's a sediment budget for the bay. There are different uh, sediment cells up and down the coast that function differently, and to plan a wetland in any one particular place, you have to understand how that works uh, in that place. But some of the things that we know for sure, I think, uh, we need to restore sooner rather than later. Uh, and the the restoration needs to be coordinated and regional. Bigger is better. Bigger is much better. The bigger, the better. The more regional, the better. Uh, and the, the practitioners in state government and outside, I think, uh, could really use some kind of clearinghouse for information and research because uh, things are moving fast and it's hard to keep up and we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. I've shown you a number of our projects here uh, and in fact, we learned as we went along from each project. So I want to leave you with a pretty uh, picture of a beautiful uh, tidal wetland. It's, uh, it's breeding birds like crazy. The mudflat is uh, helping the, the marsh uh, accrete and protect the land behind it. And it is sequestering uh, a great deal of carbon as it goes. And I guess with that, we'll take questions. And I think the idea is to bring Will back so that you can ask both of us questions. That's great. All right, so uh, the plan is that if you have a question for either Will or Sam, that you could uh, aim it at one of them or both, and we have about 10 minutes for questions. Thank you, Barbara Dye, Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy. I love the idea of an information clearinghouse. Can we broaden it so it's not just about wetlands restoration? Can we talk about a clearinghouse for all kinds of coastal and inland restoration? Get some support behind that. Sure. I'm sure that Ruth will be right on that. <laughs> I thought that you were the one. Oh, is that me? <laughs> I think we have to invent the internet first, though, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Um, God, for the last 10 years of my life, we've been trying to figure out how to keep sedimentation from happening. So uh, the Clean Water Act doesn't cause, considers it a pollutant. Right. We don't want to erode places in the watershed. We want to keep watersheds re, you know, re, um, protected. Where are you going to get this stuff, and how are you going to keep it off the rocky habitats? Well, in some cases, uh, taking down dams would be a good step. Um, taking down the Matillaha Dam will nourish the beaches uh, south of the mouth of the, uh, of the river. Um, but we do have this, we have this problem of the, the, the legacy of the infrastructure that, that we've built. Now, here in the Bay Area, uh, because there's constant dredging of the navigation channels, we're planning on using that, although that may not be that may not be enough, uh, so it's a problem. We're also, um, we'd like to take a look at the rules under which we are allowed or not allowed to use different sediment types because we think that the regulators may be being too conservative and we're proposing some research to see if in fact there's some sediment that we didn't think we could use but that actually we we, we could use. Uh, we've also done some research for some of the beach nourishment projects, most notably in San Diego, where we looked at where can we take it from safely, where can it go 
safely. So I don't think there's any, there's no single answer to your question. It becomes a series of, in this place, how much do we have? Where is it coming from? Where can we get more? What are the impacts of, of, of getting more? And how can we solve the problem in a, in a particular place? The one other thing I, I want to mention, the Ocean Protection Council, which my agency staffs, is launching a, a series of studies uh, designed to move us from the gross generalization of you know, one to three feet of sea level rise to uh, you know, on the beach in Ventura, this is how high the water's gonna come, this is what the storm churges will look like, and this is what it's going to do to the amount of, of coastal erosion that's taking place because we really have to plan for specific places with specific characteristics uh, and and that's, a, that's a big research agenda I think we have that's gonna happen over the next four or five years. You wanna add to the? In, in not an answer to your question, but a plea. Um, as we think about things like sediment and wetland protection, I, I think we have to realize that what we are facing are making the best decisions from a series of greatly imperfect options. And uh, I would, my plea to all of you who are concerned about the wildlands and the natural environment of California is that we cannot do our jobs unless we also look at what humans need, the housing that is needed in California, the transportation infrastructure. And let me give you an example of that. Uh, there's a lot of sand mining in San Francisco Bay, and that's used for making concrete to build freeways, to build houses, and so forth. There is now increasing concern that that sand mining is taking uh, sediment out of the budget and is causing coastal erosion and is causing other problems in San Francisco Bay. From the, so from the, the, the perspective of looking at the natural environment, we ought to just stop doing that. The, the sand mining industry recently, in a very, very clever approach, Join Jerry Brown when he said we have to stop and reduce the emissions that are coming from ships that are coming into California by pointing out that we are importing a lot of aggregate into California from foreign nations. And uh, in an analogy with local farming, what they say is we ought to do more local sand mining and more local quarries as a way of reducing our carbon footprint. So both of them are right. And we need to find that balance that looks at all aspects of the problem and not just at the natural environment side of it. Okay. Eric, we have it in the back, right by. There's been a lot of uh, support uh, in the Bay Area and other areas to purchase lands. And, but the next step is restoration and there's getting to be more support for that. But concurrent with that, we need to monitor what happens so that we can inform decisions on our restoration plans going in the right trajectory or not. I don't see a lot of support for this monitoring and management of the lands. Uh, I'd like your thoughts on how we might be able to kind of shift the paradigm from just running around and purchasing everything to actually managing what we got. Well, it's, it's, it's clear to me that the legislature ought to just appropriate more money for it. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is largely a financial issue, and we are a wealthy country, and the fact that we choose not to tax ourselves is a political choice, not a, you know, it's not anything that's written in stone. This could get me thrown out of my job, but <laughs> hey, what the hell. It's not um, a podcast, so we'll just... Yeah, and... Uh, the, most of the projects that we are involved in now require monitoring and we build monitoring into them and we uh, have been able to scrape together the money to monitor them in an ongoing basis, but it's pretty, it's a spit and bailing wax, uh, bailing wire uh, uh, operation. Uh, and, uh, the, um, and this is true generally, I think, in the natural resource field, it's certainly true in the marine protected areas and, uh, and in a lot of the land acquisition. So it's a big problem. I, I think one of the solutions is that if you look at that slide, 
as we're dealing with sea level rise and we think about how we design our bay, our shorelines, the question is, can we use the economic engine of development to put in place resilient, sustainable communities that incorporate flood protection and some of this, and as part of the economic engine of development, provide the money to do the monitoring and the restoration. So instead of the facing a choice of it's either development or it's spending a lot of public money to acquire, restore, and monitor, the question is, are we better off with half of that that we don't have to pay for? And Los Angeles is looking at that in their Los Angeles River Plan. And here in the Bay Area, Hilda Bay just released a report that talks about how we can uh, use some kind of an assessment district to pay for the restoration and monitoring of our wetlands. All right. Okay. Can you it's hear on. me now? It's on. I guess so. Sorry about that. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you envision kind of the transition, I mean, it's obviously taking place, of um, coastal protection and wetland uh, restoration in light of some of this new data that's coming out and how different agencies and nonprofits and people engaged in these projects will be able to tap into that information to inform how these projects go forward. Uh, well, it's going to be a very messy process, I think, uh, and I can talk about some of the things that are going on. I mean, I, I know that the Coastal Commission uh, uh, has been uh, essentially going through the same process that Will has gone through that led to his, the, uh, the proposal that he talked about at the end of his uh, uh, paper, and there's a, a group uh, of uh, folks who have been gathered around the... Um, the Ocean Protection Council that are thinking about how we've done coastal protection versus how we need to need to do it in the future. Um, one problem that hasn't been discussed very much, which I think we're going to need to really think about, is the the question of easements, both how we do easements in the future, because easements are not designed to be adaptable; they're designed to be fixed, uh, and we have an enormous legacy of fixed easements that say this piece of land or this part of the coast is going to be managed for these purposes in perpetuity and if you don't do it, you know, go to jail. Um, but of course it's going to get warmer and wetter and different species are going to move in. And uh, So I, I think there's a lot of ferment right now happening within the agencies to try to, you know, consider how we're going to, uh, how we're going to do things differently. Do you want to add to that? Well, I, I talked about how I saw the Bay Area is absolutely destined to be a leader on this because of the conditions we have here. Um, I think the first step is for the Moore Foundation, the Packard Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation to say, gee, that's a great idea. Let's fund a pilot project. Let's find an area where we can bring together government through its, its regulatory authority, its planning, the academic community, the innovators, and let's figure out a new way of how we do it and let's try it out. And I think when we try it out, then we can take it on the road and save the world. All right. I'd like to thank very much our two speakers. That was great.